Okay, excellent. So, uh, welcome to our viewers from KIMEP and elsewhere. I'm Chris Primiano, Director of CCASC at KIMEP and Assistant Professor of International Relations. Uh, for this event, we will focus on the turbulent events that took place here in Almaty, and we will focus on Putin's invasion of Ukraine. We have an excellent group to discuss these issues. All have written extensively on Central Asian politics. Joanna Lillis is a Kazakhstan-based journalist who reports on Central Asia and has lived and worked in the region since 2001. Her work has been featured in The Economist, The Guardian, The Independent, Eurasianet, Foreign Policy, and Politico. She is author of Dark Shadows, <clears throat> Inside the Secret World of Kazakhstan. Uh, Igorim Tulakanova is an independent journalist from Kazakhstan. She researches human rights and freedom of the press in Central Asia. And as a former digital editor with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Kazakh service. Timur Umarov is a, is a fellow at the Carnegie, Cent Carnegie Moscow Center. His research focuses on Central Asian countries, domestic and foreign policies, <clears throat> as well as China's relations with Russia and Central Asian neighbors. A native of Uzbekistan, Timur has degrees in China studies and international relations from the Russian Presidential Academy of National, Eco national Economy and Public Administration and Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Uh, he's an alum of the Carnegie Tsinghua Center's Young Ambassadors and the Carnegie Endowment's Central Asian Futures Program. Welcome to the three of you. For this talk, uh, in which Nurseet and I will moderate, we will pose questions to our panel members, and members of the panel have the liberty to respond the way they see fit. Uh, I'd like this to be a free-flowing conversation uh, in which members of the panel can respond, as mentioned before, however they see fit, as opposed to question, answer, question, answer. Okay. Um, so for members of the panel, just uh, please raise the hand icon and we'll be happy to call on you. This talk is being recorded and the recording may capture the video or the display names of audience members. If you do not wish to be recorded for members of the audience, uh, please keep your camera off. During the talk, we encourage members, uh, audience members to send us any questions or comments uh, you can send them to me or to your seat, and then we will pose the questions to our panel. Let's get started. So, the, for the first question, uh, we'll go in chronological order, focusing on the events or bloody January, and then making, it way, making the way to uh, Ukraine. To what extent did the Nazarbayev faction uh, co-opt or orchestrate the January events? And what evidence do we have to support such views? Who would like to start us off with that? Could I start? Sure. Um, I think we're, lack we're lacking a lot of evidence for everything that happened in January in Kazakhstan. And I think that's um, one of the points that we need to be focused on as we, um, you know, there's been three months nearly and um, there is a lot of opacity and a lot of obfuscation about what really happened. Um, uh, as for question about evidence of the involvement of the Nazarbayev family, I think we, we have a we probably have a big clue in the arrest of his nephew uh, that happened over this weekend, his nephew Kairat Satibaldi. Now, rumors of involvement of Nazarbayev family members have been swirling around Kazakhstan ever since the violence broke out. And, you know, two names that have been have been mentioned very frequently are the names of his nephews, um, Kairat Satibaldi. Samat Habish is another one, um, the deputy chair um, of the um, National Security uh, committee at the time, um, most of the deputies were arrested, but he continued to walk uh, free. Um, we obviously have seen a lot of uh, perceptions that uh, perhaps um, high-level people are being protected, um, that there are, there are reasons for that. Uh, but we are seeing um, Tokayev taking, I would, I would say Tokayev taking a lot more aim at the, at the, at the Nazarbayev family. Um, this was the first arrest we saw of a close family member. I mean, this was this was unthinkable only days ago in Kazakhstan, and we don't know where it's taking us. We've also seen Nazarbayev's brother, that the rich and powerful businessman Bolat Nazarbayev, named this week in a statement in which law enforcement um, said they had um, they had um, put an end to some 
uh, what they described as illegal crypto mining operations. Now, that might sound like a small thing, but these are very lucrative operations, and they are the kind of operations that have plunged Kazakhstan into darkness on, on many occasions in, in recent months or, or at least a few months ago uh, because they're consuming so much energy. So I would say when, we come, when we're looking at evidence, we're going to have to look for circumstantial evidence if um, Tokayev and others aren't going to be kind of um, upfront about it for reasons best known to themselves, but obviously political reasons, reasons um, um, of wanting to maintain some kind of um, elite status quo. But we're certainly seeing um, the net looks like it's closing in on the family, um, even if it's not on all members. So I'm sure someone else has something to say about that. Timur, Igrim. Um, okay, I will start. I think that um, indeed, as Joanna mentioned, um, there are a lot of unanswered questions what really happened in January, because it still seems to me that everything was mixed up together, like nationwide protests and elements of some criminal organization activity and um, we have some hints, but um, not direct pointing and who is um, to blame for. And I think that um, maybe right now um, in the highest echelons of power, there are still some kind of um, negotiations going on or some talks whether um, or not some people can be um, taken or arrested, right? Because as Joanna mentioned, we in Kazakhstan haven't thought that such a powerful person as Khaira Tatsubaldi might be um, detained. And um, to me, it seems that uh, maybe the people who uh, probably did something that um, is hard uh, to just close eyes um, for society at, and are being detained. Uh, but um, it also means that um, I think Tokayev is slowly consolidating his power and is building his own team uh, right now and um, is also kind of working in the same way, trying to find a loyalist to him, not really just um, trying to bring some um, genuine change that people were asking. Uh, so yeah, it's a long process and I still don't know where it's going. Um, we have to see and monitor that. Uh, Timo, would you like to add anything to that or should we move on? Yeah, I would just um, agree with uh, everything that was said. And um, right now at this point, it seems like it was hundreds of years ago, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so so much has happened since uh, January and so much has changed. Um, and um, I just want yeah, to say that we are maybe in the very beginning of a huge transformation of all uh, Central Asian countries, not only because of the crisis of uh, January 2022, but also because of what is happening right now uh, in Ukraine. Lucy, would you like to go ahead with the next one or? Yeah, um, thank you very much. There is one question related to the January events. Uh, which is, was the media coverage of the events in January by the Western media correct? Because uh, during the internet uh, lockdown, uh, those outside of Kazakhstan, it appears like they had a different idea of what was actually going on in Kazakhstan. So I think this is a very legitimate question. Maybe uh, Joanna would be the right person to ask to answer this, please. Sure, thank you, Nilsay. That is a good question. Um, well, um, I think um, it's. I think it is fair to say. I think it's certainly fair to say. True to say, I know for a fact that um, you know government officials were very upset with some of the media coverage that they felt was very simplistic in Western media coverage. I'm talking about now. They didn't help themselves by imposing massive communications blockouts so that it was impossible to get information to people who are outside Kazakhstan. Um, but um, I do think, you know, I do think it, it is fair to say that there is a grain of truth in what they say, in the sense that um, I think the Western media, um, and that goes for TV especially, and TV crews did get in here, uh, British, American, and so on, 
Um, but and I think also some of the some of the newspapers, the the respective newspapers, did take a, quite a simplistic line on what happened. I mean, basically, it was easier for many Western journalists, especially those who didn't really understand Kazakhstan, to come in and say that um, the authorities just opened fire on peaceful protesters. Now, I think um, we should all be clear that that's not um, exactly what happened. Um, in, in the sense that it is definitely true that peaceful protesters got shot. And we've even seen the prosecutor's office admitting to a certain number of deaths this week of people who they say definitely weren't, weren't obviously committing any crime. Um, 20, they said, out of those who died, I think, in MRT. Uh, but um, perhaps it's more than that. But what, what I think is, is the case that um, the Western media took it as saying that, okay, peaceful protesters took to the street, they were trying to have some kind of revolution, they were trying to demand political change, the authorities, uh, the, the, the security forces came and opened fire on them. Um, now I'm sure Agarim will have some insights into this as well, but I mean, what, what we did see was violent elements hijacking the protests, armed mobs um, raiding armed shops and seizing weapons, uh, people storming um, presidential residency, the um, city hall setting fire to it, and people committing acts of violence on, on I think, civilians as well as um, certainly um, acts of violence against law enforcement officers. So this wasn't such a clear cut case. And I think this is a case when the Western media um, really didn't get down into the detail and simply painted it as a good versus bad versus bad kind of um, scenario. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I personally think that that, that, that that there was a grain of truth in what the government said, but it didn't help himself, but it helped, they didn't help mm -hmm. themselves with the way they presented the um, case. And also I just add that Tokayev saying he gave a shoot to kill order um, simply played into that, played into that um, because I think um, it's probably clear that he didn't really mean shoot um, peaceful protesters. Um, he meant those committing acts of violence, but he didn't say so. And mm -hmm. um, certainly peaceful people got shot. Mm -hmm. And in addition, one uh, question that arises from this one is how did the Western media portray these events as a coup, a revolution, a riot? Because uh, as in Ukraine, there is a lot to the choice of words used to characterize these events. Timur Agiri, maybe you could, what's your take? What was it, a revolution or a coup or just a mob? Um, yeah, Timur, go ahead. All right. Um, I, I would just say that um, for us, it's, uh, you know, uh, very comfortable when we have one label on um, any, you know, very difficult and multi-layer process. Uh, but it's, uh, for me, what happened in uh, Kazakhstan uh, is, as Igerim said, is a combination of different processes. And I don't want to kind of oversimplify it by naming it with one certain term. Um, and, and because we saw, you know, um, and process, uh, protests on the one hand, on the other, we saw uh, attempt of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, fight for uh, power. We we saw a clash of uh, different groups of elites. So um, it all cannot be named with one term that exists in my view. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that um, while this was all happening, um, I was outside of Kazakhstan and I got a lot of uh, media requests to answer what's going on in the country and a lot of people uh, like western uh, media uh, was very focused on uh, the question uh, of uh, cfto troops for example are they going to stay inside kazakhstan for indefinite time uh, do people of kazakhstan want that and all the other um, geopolitical um, questions and um I think that um, in general, the Western media coverage, um, as uh, many mentioned, uh, was trying to be simplified to one term, which is the case for many media uh, coverage in, in different uh, places. Uh, but I also wanted to um, maybe stress that I think sometimes um, what uh, out, outsiders uh, who don't uh, read news about Central Asia or who don't uh, have experience living there or knowing local people, they also want to somehow um, present um, Central Asian countries 
as the ones lacking agency um, in their own geopolitical, um, let's say, game or politics. And um, I've seen it with the coverage of Ukraine as well. Uh, many uh, people, many scholars would, um, I don't know, uh, assume that uh, Kazakhstan or other Central Asian countries would just blindly follow what Russia says or what Russia orders, uh, which uh, as a person coming from Kazakhstan, I know it's not the case because even though we have authoritarian government, uh, which rarely listens to its people, um, I think January events showed the very fragile uh, position that Tokayev is in and that he still needs this public support to do the policies he wants. Um, that's why he did this um, address to the nation, uh, I think yesterday or two days ago, I already lost the count to this, um, and etc. So I think that's um, what um, maybe uh, outsiders of uh, Central Asia uh, should kind of notice that um, these governments, these states have their own kind of capacity to build their own policies. And looking at the people uh, who are um, kind of demanding these changes. Thank you. Thank you. In, the, uh, in the chat box, we have a question uh, for Joanna from our colleague Nadim. Uh, so Joanna, Nadim asks, uh, you've been covering Kazakhstan for over two decades. From your perspective, if we distinguish between the precipitating cause and deep cause uh, regarding the January unrest, uh, what were the deep causes uh, of the January unrest? Yeah, thank you, Nadine. That's a great question. And I think we should be focusing on those deep causes. Um, I mean, um, obviously, we, we can single out two deep causes. One are the grievances that brought protesters onto the street in the first place. And one is the elite infighting and um, possible um, elite, um, uh, possible, as the cry puts it, attempt to seize power. And I think if we go back, I think we've talked about the elites and how they were fighting amongst themselves. Um, and I think we really should focus on what the people wanted. Why did the people go out onto the streets? Um, well, I mean, we really see some deep-seated grievances that people in Kazakhstan have been voicing for decades, basically. Um, the initial um, spark for the protest was a rise in the price of um, the type of fuel that many, many motorists use to drive to fuel their cars. Um, and that's what brought people out in the west of Kazakhstan, the oil-rich west, which is traditionally always a hotbed of, um, of opposition, if you like, for the government. Um, but really, it was amazing to me how quickly the protesters started to, the protests started to snowball, and the protesters started to voice other grievances right from really the very first day. And these included um, other socioeconomic grievances that people have been struggling with for well, well over a decade in Kazakhstan, you know, since the oil boom is long since over. Um, and these include things like low salaries, um, cost of living, um, and also rampant corruption that people see as really impacting their lives. And, and also, um, first of all, in the way that they, they can't get jobs if they can't uh, bribe people to get them, but also in the way that they, they feel resentment about the way maybe officials live, some officials live in contrast to the way they live. So real resentments over that rich-poor divide and over, over that... Um, the, the, the usurpation of economic assets, really, by, by uh, um, uh, a well-connected few. And also, political grievances are also interesting to me was how quickly um, all this snowballed into political grievances, which often you find with socio-economic protests. I don't know, people focus on the things that affect their daily lives, but people have really understood now um, in Kazakhstan, where people have become much more politicized, I would say, since the resignation of Nursultan Nazarbayev three years ago and the rise to power of, power of Tokayev, people really started to address, uh, to voice those political grievances. I mean, we know that the slogan of the protest was Shalket, old man out or old man go, referring to Nazarbayev and more widely referring to that old Soviet era political establishment that's out of touch with people. But also people were calling for, you know, elections for their local officials. The people have reached this understanding that unless their political classes will represent them, um, you know, unless they're accountable to them and not to the people who appoint them, then, then they won't get results that, that bring improvements to their daily lives. So all of those deep-seated grievances um, that we heard. Timur or Igrim for like structural causes, um, 
regarding the events of January? Uh, if I may add, I think that definitely um, economic um, economic problems in the country have been one of the main factors to drive this um, protest. And um, as Joanna mentioned, people are finally starting to link economic to political, and um, that's how uh, it snowballed and uh, people started to uh, voice their grievances um, that have been long ignored. And I think that um, apart from um, unemployment, ra rampant corruption, and other things uh, in the last uh, few years, um, people ha have started to read uh, more independent uh, news outlets uh, who have been um, uh, reporting about different um, assets of the ruling family or the, the people close to the first family. And um, many people started to, um, local people just started to contact journalists, for example, saying, hey, th there is a house of this person. I want you to come and do an investigation about it. So um, this factor also uh, kind of showed that there is a deep inequality in society that some people are barely surviving, uh, no matter how hard they work, but others who are close to elites, they are above the law, they can um, do some illegal activities, they can be rich and uh, they, uh, the law doesn't touch them. So this is also another factor that uh, brought people to the streets. And um, even though there are still not so many politically active uh, people in Kazakhstan. I think that um, it's growing every day. And since 2019, it keeps growing and more and more, especially young people are interested to be involved in political processes in the country and uh, somehow contribute to the society in, in Kazakhstan. And then maybe in terms of like how to move forward then, what needs to be done to improve the situation, reduce tensions, pre prevent something like that from happening again. Timur um, or anyone else on the, on the panel? Yeah, actually what um, President Akayev and the Kazakh leadership is doing right now, I think they're trying their best to cope with the you know, structural problems that were there and uh, ec economists and people were talking about that. I, I, I think number one problem here is um, debt delinquency that um, there is uh, in Kazakh society. Uh, if we take a look at um, even official numbers, uh, they are very high. Uh, These not hundreds of thousands of people who uh, didn't pay back their uh, bank debt. Uh, it's millions. Um, according to uh, Rahima Shakbayev, uh, the head of um, Talap um, uh, Research Institution, uh, the number of people who um, haven't paid back uh, their debts is around 6 million, uh, which is insane because um, um, there are 11 million people who can uh, work in, in Kazakhstan. Yeah? Um, uh, and uh, this makes uh, almost 60% of those who are eligible of uh, working, um, having problems with banks, uh, and, uh, you know, problems with um, bank officials who show up and uh, want uh, their money back. So this is number one problem, the uh, law of uh, individual bankruptcy, uh, which Tokayev has already told about and uh, which was postponed for the last, I don't know, um, seven years. Um, uh, and um, I think this is... Uh, something that the current administration will be working on. And of course, um, the big package of uh, socioeconomic um, uh, activities and um, different um, um, uh, laws that uh, the uh, Takaev administration is talking about. Of course, it's um, about uh, the prices on uh, gas, uh, which actually uh, brought to... Uh, this in the first place, 
this is also about jobs, about uh, social um, inequality, um, about uh, poverty, uh, about jobs uh, in uh, rural areas. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of uh, work to do for uh, the current administration and um, uh, yesterday's uh, speech uh, was mainly uh, focused on political changes, political reforms. But before that, um, in uh, February, there were several um, uh, Takayev's uh, important speeches that and, and, and an interview uh, to Khabar 24, um, there were mainly, uh, where, where Tukhaev mainly talked about economic reforms. And um, I think this is where uh, Kazakhstan will be moving forward. So it sounds like you're emphasizing more economic, like in your view, more economic reforms as opposed to political reforms than... Um, yeah, of course, um, uh, there will be uh, some political reforms, and uh, especially after we heard uh, Takayev saying um, a, a lot of, uh, actually, you know, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, there were a lot of, um, 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 I would say, even groundbreaking, maybe, uh, to a certain point, uh, announcements about, um, uh, you know, reforms in a parliamentary system uh, about how uh, parties um, or work, uh, but in my view, um, these are still not uh, real structural reforms. But maybe Joanna has um, a better understanding uh, from uh, on the ground. Joanna, Joanna. Are you muted? Sorry, sorry. Um, yes, um, thank you. No, I'm not sure I have a better understanding, but I do think um, it, what Tim was talking about, um, Tokayev's speech yesterday was um, his clear attempt to kind of come out and really tell the people he gets it <laughs> and to kind of say that he wants to really reset relations between the state and the people that have really deteriorated so severely in the last years of Nazarbayev and in the, um, and just over the last few years as well, they haven't um, improved since Tokayev came to power because of so many resentments over the way he came to power, just anointed by Nazarbayev, basically. Um, so he even knew, himself used the word stagnation um, in his uh, speech yesterday. And I think that's something that people have been feeling for many years now in Kazakhstan. Um, he, he basically has made it clear that he really thinks that a root and branch kind of um, reform of both politics and the political system and the economic system is what's required to um, address the grievances of the people and also address the stru structural problems in Kazakhstan that are preventing growth, preventing, well, these things are all connected, preventing people from feeling satisfied with their lives. Um, no, he really did um, announce a lot of positive reforms. I mean, some of them are very kind of nitty gritty type things, um, um, you know, involving local governance and so on. Um, the one thing I would say is there were a lot of positive reforms. Um, uh, one I would highlight is the move of the parliamentary system, where, whereby instead of 100% of seats being on part, elected seats being on party lists, which are basically dictated by the ruling party, um, now 70% will be on party lists, but 30% will be um, are, are on, a, on a single seat constituencies, which will allow independent candidates to stand, we assume. Um, but um, what, we're, what we're watching for in terms of politics, I think Tim also covered quite, quite pretty, very well the um, economic structural reforms that we, we, we need. But in terms of politics, um, Tokayev announced further liberalization of the law on political parties, but let, we've been here before. He himself liberalized the law on political parties after he came to power. And yet we went into a parliamentary election just over a year ago with no opposition parties registered in Kazakhstan. Still three years after he came to power, no opposition parties have been able to register. So what we need is that to translate into the actual um, willingness of the government to register those opposition parties so they can stand in elections and be represented in parliament and we can ha and Kazakhstan can have a more representative parliament and the government will benefit from that too because right now they just have no dialogue with the people and that's why people took to the streets in such numbers. The one thing I would say is Tokayev maybe in the opinion of many people I've spoken to was not bold enough yesterday. For example, there were so many rumors that he was going to introduce elections for um, mayors of the largest cities in Kazakhstan who are presidential appointees, appointees 
and of regions in Kazakhstan. Um, and instead, he stopped short of that. And I think people were very disappointed about that. And that's one of the demands the protesters were making from day one. Thank you. In the chat box, one more question regarding the events, and then we can move on to Ukraine. In the chat box, we have a question from Sergey Karim. Uh, he asks, we have seen that January events to some extent affected the economy of Kazakhstan because of temporary political instability. Can you estimate the effects on the economy that was brought by these issues? Did Kazakhstan lose a big amount of foreign investments? Let me go ahead. Um, I, I think that what is happening right now in Ukraine will have much bigger uh, influence uh, and much bigger effect for Kazakh economy. Uh, but the, the uh, protests and um, instability of January didn't uh, hit uh, Kazakhstan that much. Um, um, of course, there are estimates of um, uh, 2.5 um, million uh, dollars uh, uh, down down turn. Um, uh, and um, of course, we see Almaty uh, almost, you know, uh, destroyed in uh, several place, uh, places. But um, at, at the end of the day, we didn't see um, many investors, uh, you know, going away from Kazakhstan or uh, trying to uh, stop their business there because of the uh, events and um, actually uh, the crisis the active uh, period of crisis was uh, pretty short not to let um, you know investors to feel uh, insecure about uh, the future of Kazakhstan but what what is happening right now in Russia uh, with uh, sanctions uh, will hit Kazakhstan much harder uh, than January and then, so Timur, you were talking about Ukraine and Russia, so that's a good segue actually to our next topic. Uh, Nursi, do you want to get us started with um, Ukraine? Yeah, sure. So um, to begin with uh, the question of uh, Ukraine, so good. Could the differing approaches to the Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine exacerbate the political divides between the Central Asian countries? For instance, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kyrgyz government publicly supported the Russian special operation, while Kazakhstan had to remain um, ambivalent. Uh, do you think these divides in Central Asia will go even further, or they will all just uh, support the Russia's uh, cause? Joanna? Yeah. Um I think um, the effect on internal the internal relations between the Central Asian countries of their differing stances shouldn't probably be over exaggerated. Um, I mean, they they often have differing um, opinions on things, of course, and there there are many differences among the countries, especially right now among Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Um, not not so much on Ukraine, but on all kinds of other things. Um, but what I do think is actually notable, and we we're, we're really noting that today. Um, is um, the fact that um, the, some of the countries that are supposed to be Russia's biggest allies are not supporting it over this. Now, Kazakhstan came out pretty um, clearly, and, and while not criticizing and while espousing a public group's position of neutrality and calling for peace and so on, um, you know, Kazakhstan came out immediately saying it wouldn't recognize the um, self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. And um, uh, has also, um, you know, sent humanitarian aid on a government level to Ukraine, and has also had. We, but Takayev is the only Central Asian president who has spoken to Zelensky, and also Kazakhstan um, also um, allowed a protest, an anti-war protest, to take place um, in Almaty. Um, but what's notable today, of course, is um, Uzbekistan has um, put, sort of come off the fence and. Um, said it won't recognize those self-proclaimed republics and also supported the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Now, um, I think we, we shouldn't underestimate the fact that the two biggest countries in Central Asia, the two key economies and political um, centers of power are both absolutely united on their stance. Um, and I think that's um, quite um, psychologically interesting for the region at, at this geopolitically challenging time. Uh, Timur, maybe? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with uh, uh, Joanna. And 
Uh, I want to just add that um, uh, Russia for, um, uh, for, for the last decade or so has been a lonely power um, since, um, you know, its action in Crimea earlier in Georgia was, were not supported by anyone um, at all, um, not by, uh, you know, even today, uh, Belarus uh, is, um, of course, uh, dragged into this war, but uh, even in this situation, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, wants to stay as neutral as possible and uh, publicly says that uh, Belarusian arms are not involved in this uh, war and stuff like that. Um, and he publicly says that um, it's not us who started the war, uh, which can be, uh, um, uh, you know, understood uh, by different, uh, in different ways. So, um, um, if uh, even Belarus is not supporting Russia, of course, uh, Kazakhstan and other Central Asian countries will not, you know, blindly follow uh, uh, Russia's uh, pathway here, uh, uh, especially uh, when you hear Vladimir Putin saying that Ukraine um, is not a real country and uh, doesn't have the right to exist. Uh, everyone in Central Asia can, you know, put themselves in the shoes of Ukraine and uh, um, understand that um, if uh, they will agree with uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine, they kind of automatically agree with possible uh, actions towards themselves. So um, uh, here I think nobody will really go ahead and um, accept uh, what is happening right now uh, in Ukraine. Thank you, Timur. Again, what, what about, about uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan? Uh, I know you're not an expert in these countries, but I'm just curious, uh, I think, as well as the audience. Well, I think uh, in general, like it took many days for Central Asian countries to just assess the situation, how bad it's going to be and how, let's say, lonely Russia is going to be in this um, uh, war. and. Um, it's getting more clear that um, almost no one supports Russia's actions in Ukraine um, on international level. Um, and um, I think that's why Central Asian countries uh, like more or less uh, can boldly state that we do not support um, the invasion and we do not um, agree with um, independence of Donetsk and Luhansk and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but with um, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, I think um, they are um, more dependent on Russia, um, at least in terms of remittances, for example. Uh, Tajikistan is very much dependent um, on um, workers uh, in Russia uh, sending money back to Tajikistan. And Turkmenistan in general is a very close, uh, isolated country. and it's not a surprise that they didn't uh, publicly state their position. Um, but um, I also wanted to mention that as Timur said, um, uh, when this happened, um, a lot of my peers, um, not just in Central Asia, but in Georgia, in, um, where else? Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, other uh, post-Soviet uh, countries, uh, they were all shaken by this and um, it was like a nightmare come true that Russia invades not just Ukraine but other countries and I think um, what is happening in terms of um, publicly stating the positions of the country is also an act of solidarity that um, each uh, post-Soviet country respects its sovereignty and independence enough uh, even though it may mean uh, certain consequences from Russia, which we still don't know yet, uh, but um, this is like um, a higher kind of value, uh, the independence and sovereignty than other uh, things um, that are dependent on Russia. Thank you, Igor. In terms of, outs if we go outside of, uh, of Central Asia, I'd say we see numerous countries uh, not condemning Russia and, and China, Israel, India, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and for me, China has tremendous leverage over Russia. Uh, if China were to be on board with Western sanctions regarding Russia, 
I think r r uh, the situation would be very different uh, in terms of Russia's uh, willingness to move forward with its actions in Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, China abstained on the uh, with the UN Security Council vote condemning Russia. And if we were to see, in my view at least, if we were to see China uh, being more aggressive, I mean, China claims that it respects territorial in integrity uh, and yet has admonished the West for the situation in Ukraine, saying that it's the US's fault, it's NATO's fault, uh, instead of denouncing Putin for his, inv his illegal invasion of another country. Um, so, and then actually, if we want to bring in China to this, just given that number, uh, a number of us here on this panel focus on China, uh, does anyone, would anyone like to respond uh, regarding Ch China's role? Or as, I mean, if you feel free to disagree, but I view, I view it that China is providing tremendous support uh, for Russia on this issue. Feel free to disagree. So. Um, I think we should be kind of uh, realistic here. And uh, when uh, war in Ukraine happened, uh, China found itself in a very uncomfortable situation because um, it has to, uh, uh, you know, uh, live with uh, two uh, very different, uh, but at the same time, uh, very important factors here. On the one hand, there is a uh, strategic um, uh, friendship, uh, if you want, with Russia. Um, and uh, on the other, uh, there are basic principles that uh, China has been uh, publicly announcing for uh, the last uh, 70 years, uh, territorial integrity and so sovereignty. Uh, these are the principles that China uh, uh, always um, publicly claims to be um, you know, very important and untouchable. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what is happening right now in Ukraine is um, happening on the background of uh, uh, China's, you know, worst uh, case uh, relations with the West um, ever. Uh, just look at uh, how China and the US acted during the pandemic. Um, it was supposed to be a crisis that would bring enemies together. Uh, because, you know, this is the pandemic, uh, something that uh, nobody is to blame for, uh, the perfect enemy. Uh, more perfect enemy could be just aliens coming to Earth um, and uh, invading <laughs> everyone. Uh, but even the pandemic, this perfect enemy could not bring uh, the US and China together. Uh, n there will be no, uh, you know, conflict or crisis on Earth uh, that can bring them together. And that is why um, we shouldn't think that uh, China will uh, somehow on any issue um, uh, forget about its, uh, you know, structural problems with the West and um, uh, do something together with the West. Everything that China is doing and will be doing during the 21st century will be against the West. Um, and we should uh, think about that as, as, a, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, coming back maybe um, to uh, Central Asia, I think uh, chi uh, the uh, amount of sanctions that are put on Russia right now, um, I, I don't I feel even comfortable calling it sanctions because it looks like embargo, uh, will uh, definitely make uh, Russia not as, um, you know, attractive partner in terms of economic um, um, economic uh, sphere for Central Asian countries, and they will have to uh, diversify their ties. And here, China comes as you know, number one, uh, um, uh, number one variant uh, to uh, change uh, Russia in terms of uh, technological imports, um, in terms of um, you know, um, trade and um, uh, stuff like that. So. Uh, at the end of the day, if you uh, uh, think about China, China is kind of winning uh, out of the, this war that uh, it's not even involved in. Yeah, and on that, I, in, like in my view, Xi Jinping's main international objective is a post-Western, specifically post-U.S. world order, and Putin is certainly on board um, with that outlook. So, yeah, jo uh, Joanna, you had your hand raised before. 
Ah, uh, well, I don't want to take the discussion backwards. Um, I was just going to, I was just going to say um, regarding um, Central Asia's attitude to Ukraine. I just wanted to make uh, one point about Kazakhstan. Um, you know, we didn't mention that the, the that Takayev summoned in a Russian-led uh, military force to help him um, not so much quell the protests as um, send a, as he himself has put it, send a psychological signal. I mean, to show that Putin was behind him. So one would think that Kazakhstan is one of the is probably the country in the world that is the most currently beholden to Russia, and it's very striking that Kazakhstan is not still willing to is is still willing to go out on a limb and not and not show that support. But Igerim also mentioned um, that we don't know what the consequences will be of, of, of not falling into line um, with Russia. And on that, on that point as well, I also wanted to say that we really do see a lot of black PR about Kazakhstan in the Russian media. Um, it, it, it's not um, stated by officials, but by commentators, opinion formers, including the leader of the Communist Party, Gennady Zuganov, who's taken who's made all kinds of actually completely false claims about Russophobia in Kazakhstan, about the existence of bio labs, all the kind of claims that have been made about Ukraine um, by Russian officials now are, now are being leveled against Kazakhstan by opinion formers. And I think that's extremely worrying. And it makes you wonder what's up Russia's sleeve. I mean, it's got its hands very full right now. But, um, you know, you have, to, you have to look at that. And remember that Putin also has made very spurious claims about Kazakhstan's status in the past. So, you know, it's, it is an alarming situation for Kazakhstan. So it's, uh, you have to applaud it, really, for going out there and not supporting um, Russia's position, which would be the easy option right now. We have a question uh, in the chat. And then also both Timur and uh, Joanna, um, I was thinking when you were talking, I was thinking about this issue about multi-vectorism of Kazakhstan foreign policy, like Timur, you were mentioning about due to the awful si economic situation now in Russia, uh, Central Asian states uh, perhaps most likely looking more towards China. Um, and then, so if, if members of the panel could talk about this issue about multi-vectorism, and also in the chat, we have a question from Sean Hansen asking, um, any thoughts as to whether Central Asian countries are concerned they can meet a similar circumstance as Ukraine uh, with regards to Russia trying to repossess them? Maybe, Igarim, since uh, uh, it's been a while since you last spoke, would you like to take that? Um, can you repeat the question? question? The question okay. is, uh, should the Central Asian countries be... Uh, afraid uh, that they could be in the same position as Ukraine. Uh, will Russia invade mm -hmm. Central Asia, in other words? Put simply, question that's been bothering the minds of so many people. Well, the answer is, I don't know. Nobody expected that Putin will invade Ukraine like that. Um, so we don't know what's on his mind regarding Central Asia. and. We don't know who is there to stop him if he decides to do something, because right now we're seeing that even though there is some global support for Ukraine, it's still kind of fighting alone this war. And um, it's, it's really very disturbing for many people um, in Central Asia. And um, I know that some people, after they've heard the news so about the invasion in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, they prepared emergency suitcase and found a place to go in, in case there will, will be bombs from Russia. So um, people are really scared, but also some people in Kazakhstan uh, are supporting these actions in Russia. I assume they watch Russian TV or something, and they say that it's justified. And some of these people are quite educated, and I thought they're like, um, normal <laughs> but yeah I mean it's complicated situation uh, and um, you never know what's going to happen and definitely um, there is a reason to worry uh, because we have seen as Joanna mentioned rightly all these um, media reports in Russian propaganda about uh, Kazakhstan and about um, Russian speakers uh, being discriminated in Kazakhstan. And um, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen. But I think optimistically and maybe realistically, um, Kazakhstan doesn't have that bad relationships with Russia as it had with Ukraine. 
uh, I mean Russia with Ukraine. Um, and uh, for Putin to invade Kazakhstan and Central Asia, uh, there needs to be something probably more uh, to uh, deteriorate the relationships. I don't know, maybe Kazakhstan publicly leaving the CSTO and Eurasian Economic Union and other unions. Um, so yeah, it's still in development, the situation, uh, but there is definitely a threat, potential it's threat in progress, like that. Kind of. Yeah. Timur, do you wanna? It's really difficult to, you know, kind of rationalize Russia's actions right now in Ukraine. And uh, I, uh, if you would ask me this question about, you know, uh, Central Asia possibly being invaded by uh, Russia in the future, I would say it's completely impossible to imagine uh, some of the people who are here uh, listening to us. Um, uh, I see Ulan Lukan. I, I was really arguing with him uh, on, on that particular uh, topic, saying that, you know, this is nuts and this impossible but now uh everything seems possible it seems like there are no rules uh it seems like um if um there is uh so much power in the hands of one person uh that the whole country could start a war just because uh this particular person uh thinks um about you know some kind of historical um, uh, mission or something, I don't know. But uh, again, <laughs> one more time, um, I, I'm still uh, thinking that um, uh, Russia will not, uh, Russia is not, sorry, um, uh, Kazakhstan is a different thing. Um, for uh, Vladimir Putin, Ukraine was really something that he was obsessed about, especially during the uh, quarantine time during the pandemic when uh, he was surrounded by very few people with whom he shares a lot in common um, and uh, he was reading a lot of historical uh, things and actually publicly writing about Ukraine uh, open the Kremlin site and you will see some publications of Vladimir Putin about Ukraine's history which is uh, you know not something that um a president of a country is supposed to do. Uh, so uh, for him, the question of Ukraine was really something um, as an obsession uh, that he was, uh, you know, thinking about as his mission during his presidency. And he uh, thought that, um, you know, he has to do it. But well, Kazakhstan is a different thing. Kazakhstan uh, is not a part of this kind of Russian uh word uh, um, I don't know um, I'm true, trying yeah. to rationalize the actions of uh, one person as I uh, feel like uh, very uncomfortable um, uh, let's just hope that uh, um, Vladimir Putin will not go and read <laughs> about history of Kazakhstan <laughs> in the nearest future for Putin it's still a gift yeah <laughs> uh, Kazakhstan so referring to um just like, like in that speech that Putin gave on February 21st or 25th, denouncing Lenin, Khrushchev for giving away Russian territory to Ukraine, uh, then uh, denouncing Khrushchev for giving away Crimea uh, to Ukraine. And he said about Kazakhstan uh, that, you know, Nazarbayev deserves a lot of credit because he created a state where a state had never existed. Um, Jacob asks, in the getting back to the China question, uh, would China be equally supportive or passive of Russian aggression in Central Asia as it is of Ukraine? Of course not. Um, this will be a completely different scenario uh, because China doesn't border Ukraine. Uh, China doesn't, you know, have uh, a lot of assets there. Um, and it does not have um, anything to do with uh, China's uh, internal politics uh, and internal stability. But uh, when it comes to Central Asia, it's uh, uh, China's um, uh, domestic issues are interconnected with Central Asia because we all know how China is obsessed about stability in Xinjiang, uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region. 
and that is why uh, China is um, thinking and um, you know um, has been um, acting uh, in Central Asia to support stability in this region so that it will not kind of overlap to uh, Xinjiang. So it will be a completely different scenario um, and uh, you know, I hope uh, we will not be alive <laughs> during, during uh, something like this happening. So and, I don't uh, want to analyze this. <laughs> and uh, Nadim asks a question uh, referencing John Mearsheimer, uh, who I'm, I guess we're all familiar with. Uh, so Nadim asks, uh, did NATO's expansion uh, closer to Russia's border have anything to do uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine as posited by John Mearsheimer? Um, I guess we could, I mean, we've talked about a number of reasons in terms of why Putin, how Putin views Ukraine, um, but in terms of this argument by Mearsheimer, uh, do you think it played a role, the role, the sole role uh, in that uh, it's, it's about NATO expansion? For, for anyone on the panel, or we only, actually, we only have five minutes left, so you can either respond to that or like your closing comments uh predictions mm, i uh, can add up. um well i think it's it's not like um the main reason of putin invading into ukraine of course um maybe it's just an, an excuse but it may play some role but not the big kind of role because putin has been voicing um his um views about uh, historical, let's say, injustice uh, towards Ukraine for many years. And um, in general, um, maybe this pandemic has just escalated his mind um, and he wanted to get into actions. But yeah, um, NATO is, uh, to my view, NATO is not uh, the main reason why Putin invaded Ukraine like that. and. Um, it's just an excuse um, to just do uh, like many other excuses like denazification and um, I don't know what else he said, uh, changing the government in Ukraine as many other excuses. Um, this is just one tiny part of it. Joanna? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with everything that's gone before, really. And I think on Ukraine, one closing remark is that we should definitely be very, very wary of the similarities of the situation in that, um, in certainly in terms of the attacks, unfounded and false, the unfounded attacks and falsehoods um, that Russia has spread about Ukraine. That comes from an official level, of course, about Ukraine, but also similar attacks that I've discussed that are spread about um, Kazakhstan, uh, totally unfounded in the Russian media. We should be aware of those similarities and the problems they may bring. But we should also, I think, be aware of um, major differences. And I think Timor really pointed to a major one. Um, Ch uh, China doesn't border Ukraine, it does border Central Asia. So um, Putin might have to think twice. But Northern Kazakhstan is definitely very vulnerable. And closing remark, just um, very briefly on um, the domestic Kazakh political situation, economic situation that we've been discussing. I think Kazakhstan's at a really critical juncture here. 30 years after independence, it really has had some, 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 a major shock. Um, I, I, I personally believe that um, the, the iniquities and the, um, some of the more, well, monstrous elements of the system that Nazarbayev created were thrown up to confront, uh, well, basically confront Tokayev. Um, and um, I, I do think that he understands the scale and depth and br breadth of the challenges facing him. I think he actually understands the people's grievances. I also think that he wants to do the right thing. My question, I, I'm going to leave it with a comment, uh, a question rather than a comment, is can, can, can is Tokayev bold enough, first of all, to really make the changes that are required? Um, and the second, and really the main question is, um, is Tokayev bigger than the system or is uh, the system bigger than Tokayev? If it's the former, we'll be lucky, uh, we'll be in luck and he'll make the changes. If it's the latter, the system will eat him alive. In a couple of months from now, or a couple of weeks, we could have another CCASC event in which we examine those questions there. Uh, Timur, your, your last tweet for us. Um, I would say uh, if we want to, you know, kind of um, sum everything up, uh, the one thing that is clear from these two crises um, is uh, how dangerous it is when 
um, a very small group of people have so much power in one country. I think this both uh, crisis show perfectly that uh, this is not a stable system for any government to um, exist. Um, and when you have um, uh, this uh, one group of people um, having so much power, it is actually uh, it actually creates a very fragile uh, uh, system of um, government, which can bring to so many unprecedented crises that we've seen in 2022. So Timur, Igrim, Joanna, thank you so much. Uh, Nursi, thank you also for moderating. And also special thanks to uh, my excellent uh, CCASC team, Miriam and Babur. Uh, this event would not have been possible uh, without their help. Um, so th and thank you to our audience members. Uh, and we look forward to, um, we'll have probably another CCASC event in the next couple of weeks. So hope uh, all of you will tune into that one too. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Right. Thanks, it was a pleasure. Good seeing you again, Timor. Thank you. It was nice to talk to all of you. See you later. Take care, Bye. Bye-bye.